Welcome back. I am Dean Seddon, CEO and founder of Maverick, and I have a special guest with me today. I have Duarte Garrido, and hopefully I won't get in trouble for saying that wrong because I'm a British person and have no ability to pronounce anything. Um, but Duarte, thank you for joining us. I'm going to introduce you in a minute, but uh, did I get it right? You got it right, Dean. Oh, Thanks for having gosh. me. You got it Let's just say you got it as right as uh, I've ever heard <laughs> in the UK. Okay, that's that's hopefully a compliment for me. Yeah. But um, so Duarte is the head of social media for Coca Cola HBC, and I know Duarte. Some people are going to go, "What's Coca Cola HBC?" So maybe do you want to introduce yourself and tell people a little bit about what you do and and who Coca Cola HBC is? Of course, yeah. So Coca-Cola HPC is a bottling partner of the Coca-Cola company, and it's part of the Coca-Cola company's ecosystem and sort of family of companies, uh, if you were. And uh, we are present in 29 markets, and we basically produce, bottle, and distribute uh, Coca-Cola drinks. And we've actually expanded our portfolio beyond the Coca-Cola company. Uh, so we have sort of outgrown our own family. And um, and yeah, we're one of the biggest partners. Um, we're mostly present in Europe, but parts of Africa as well. We are actually uh, started as a company in Lagos, Nigeria in the 50s, wow. and, uh, and then sort of expanded onto Europe. Uh, and yeah, here we are. Mm. Um, you may question, you know, why would a strategic bottling partner of a Coca-Cola company want to hire a head of social and communicate. I mean, we are essentially a B to B to C business, right? Mm -hmm. So we produce the beverages, we mm -hmm. sell the beverage to the, the the retailers, and then the retailers sell them to the consumers. So we have no direct to consumer business. Um, but having said that, we are a sustainability leader in our industry. Mm -hmm. So we have our own uh, business objectives in terms of brand awareness and corporate reputation, particularly in the sustainability area. So mm -hmm. that's where social media comes in, in full force. So most of the people um, watching this won't be from your sector. So they'll be looking and going, OK, uh, interesting concept, social media and, and B2B to C model. They'll have experienced probably you in the sense of the can of Coke they bought. They will have probably, it's probably come from you, but you're kind of, from the consumer's point of view, hidden behind a huge brand. Correct. So when you're now approaching social media, um, what's your objective as HBC, that is? What's your objective with social media? So our larger objective in terms of communications is to be uh, a trusted sustainability leader in the industry, in the beverage industry, to our stakeholders, and the leading 24-7 beverage partner to our customers, who are essentially those retailers, big and small. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are basically our two sort of big pillars of communication. Mm -hmm. And social media obviously can play a huge part in that, because we can identify where those communities are and we can cement our reputation and create a relationship of trust between mm -hmm. us and, and that community. So mm -hmm. I know you're a big fan of not, uh, of not creating eco chambers on, on social media, as I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not what we are aiming to do. We're aiming to create conversations and mm -hmm. to uh, cement our position as subject matter experts and thought leaders in the sustainability area within the beverage industry. Uh, and that is no small feat because yep. it is a crowded space, as you were, but we're very well positioned already as a company. So that really makes my job very easy mm -hmm. because we already have uh, the laurels. You know, we already we already um, have the, 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 G, the DJSI and the S&P uh, indexes sort of nailed down. So now mm -hmm. what we need to do is to communicate that yeah. and to and to cement our reputation within that area. So, so let me, uh, we might go a bit off topic, but that's all good because uh, I think we, we kind of said we might end up all over everywhere. There's kind of two or three 
broad categories of how people are using social media. I think three very broad here, uh, but there's the people who are using it for the kind of corporate communications, the shareholder stuff. Yeah. The, the big like key messages of the whole company. I tend to find that a lot of that doesn't really engage the market per se, or the people, your stakeholders, other than it reassures. Yeah. Then you've got the, the people uh, looking to go, actually, what we want to do is cement some key messages with our market. And then you've got the people who we want to sell to our market. Are you in the middle group there or are you going for the top end group? I would say we're a bit all over it. Uh, I don't I don't think we're exclusively in one uh, operating in one of those pillars because you know we want we do want to become sort of thought leaders and for that we do need to do some you know key corporate communications you know what we stand for as a company who we are what mm -hmm. we do uh, what we want to achieve our growth story our objectives for the year I mean social media is a place where we can communicate to our stakeholders including our shareholders mm -hmm. including investors you know we also have a, a big um, um, venture capital um, sort of arm that we want to uh, we, we want to communicate that part of the business on social media, mm -hmm. find companies that are interested uh, in creating new and uh, exciting technologies around the sustainability area, mm -hmm. most most um, mostly focused on packaging and recycling. Mm -hmm. So we're a bit all over the place. And we also obviously want to cement all our brand's reputation on social media, mm -hmm. which will ultimately be for the eyes of the consumer, for the end consumer, not our clients, not mm -hmm. the retailers, but the consumer who actually goes on to the Tesco's of the world and buys the Coke bottle or the Monster bottle or goes on to Costa, you know, buys the Costa coffee can. So all these brands, we represent them in a way as well. Yeah. So it is, it's a tricky, it's a tricky business on social because we have to you have to be a bit like a like an octopus and operate in many many different areas. And the downside now with social media, or the, the, there's loads of great stuff you can do with social media, and but the downside is particular as as like when you build a brand and put a brand on social media, you've got your objective, but you we're all we're an organization of components which are people, and. We're trying to influence people and engage people and build a community of people around our social media accounts. But equally, uh, and this is a kind of spin-off, the people within our companies can be just as big and powerful a voice in showing what a great company it is and all, all of that fun stuff because more and more companies, I think, are really realizing the power of their people. And the influence Definitely. of people and how some of the kind of ways companies run can't work because social media allows people to connect and share stories and all that kind of stuff. You can't really hide behind, um, you know, all of that stuff anymore. So what do you see are the interesting things and changes in social media, what are the things that you're thinking? Hmm, this is interesting. Which way is this going to go? I guess, I guess it all go, it all ties back to trust, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, because we are experiencing as a society a sort of epidemic of distrust, and mm -hmm. uh, and that ultimately will will result in you know, if you look at the Edelman trust barometer, the Deloitte study they all look at how employees now choose their place of work. And especially following something as um, traumatic as the great resignation or the great reshuffle or what have you, uh, we now have to be extra attentive to how we uh, build that relationship of trust with our own people, with our workforce, with our employees, because ultimately that is that relationship of trust is what's going to keep them, it's what's going to retain our talent, right? Yeah, And I think a big part of that is to create company advocates on social media. Mm -hmm. So to empower our people to be um, influencers in a way, 
sort of our first, I'm not going to call them free because obviously we pay them salaries, but they are our organic influences. Yeah. As a company, we need to cherish that mm -hmm. and we need to incentivize that and empower them to do mm -hmm. so. So even today, uh, I had a sort of what we call a capability booster, which was a, a big chat to uh, dozens of employees within the Coca-Cola HPC company all around the world, where I uh, taught them how to leverage LinkedIn mm -hmm. to build their own personal brand. Wow. And that's excellent because, yeah. you know, if they build their own personal brand, it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. They It will help them, you know, boost their career. It will help them find their voice, create their narrative. And mm -hmm. I told them, listen, some people are... Some people are cautious about personal brands and they even have a sort of a bad feeling about them. They, they think it's too much of a sort of a braggy and, yeah. you know, self-centered. Bill uh, Gore, brilliant white teeth thing. Exactly. But what I told them is this, listen, you have a personal brand, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all over the web. Mm -hmm. It's all over social media. You have a choice to control it. You have a choice to choose your narrative in the way the world perceives you, especially mm -hmm. as a as a professional. Mm -hmm. You have a choice to shape your career mm -hmm. and to shape your past career as well and where you want to go. So take it, you know, mm -hmm. and we're here to help you as a company do that. We are here to empower you to do that. And in return, what we get are employees on social media who wear the shirt, who are proud of the company they work for and who advocate on our behalf. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a no brainer. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that creates that relationship of trust and we don't control what they say at all. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, what we do is we give them the tools and we say, do with them whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And it can be terrifying for a company to do that though, isn't it? Because, <laughs> you know, you can't really, I mean, there's been, uh, and I'm not going to get you into talking about other brands so don't worry but there has been uh, instances on other platforms not linkedin at, that i've heard where employees have been highly encouraged shall we say to to present their employer in a particular way yeah. and that's probably an extreme but there is this risk that what if somebody says something that is misconstrued or or they never intended it the way they did that that can have an impact on uh, the brand. And when I'm talking to companies about that, I just say, let's be realistic. Everything that we do could have that consequence. We could, we could misjudge a TV commercial. We could misjudge a magazine advert, which brands do a lot. So why is this any different? The only difference is it's one person in their audience. It's not national television. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what happens on social media, unless it's really bad, is probably forgotten in two or three days. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it isn't though. But but I do. I mean, you took the words out of my mouth. It's it's a, if you if you're serious about trust and if you're serious about building a relationship of trust, then you have to accept that things can go wrong, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But as a company, we have we have the obligation, but also the privilege, to be here to support our employees. Mm -hmm. And if they get flank on social media for something that, that we do as a company, or if they get flank on social media for something that we've communicated wrongly, then we're here to support them. If they do a faux pas themselves, and if that is damaging to the, to the company's um, reputation, which I, to be honest, I don't see it happening unless you're unless you are a official spokesperson for the company, mm -hmm. which we also tell our employees, listen, you're not. Yeah. Right. Unless you are, you're not. So you shouldn't feel the, the that the weight of that responsibility either. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever you say on social, it's on you. Yeah. Whether it's good, whether it's bad, you will not you do not represent the company unless you're told that you do. Yeah. But we're here to support you. So if anything happens on social media that distresses an employee, I mean, I do have an open, I'm going to, I'm not going to say an open door policy because unfortunately I don't have doors. I'm fully remote, but I do have an open window policy on teams. So they can always reach out to me for advice uh, and for help. And I'm, I'm happy to be there. And regarding these mistakes that can happen that, that are threats to the company's reputation. I mean, that's a constant on social media, right? 
Mm-hmm. And the way I see it, you really, as a company, sit on either side of this fence. You're either really strict uh, on the way you do social media communications. So yep. you have a very strict playbook and a guidebook and uh, and a tone of voice where you even select words that you can or can't use, which I find appalling. But you have something really, really strict. And then you 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 sort of, you make all your social media managers and your community managers abide by those very uh, bot-like statements. It's uh, propaganda, right? Prop- yeah, it is. I mean, it's it's corporate gibberish. And and what the result of that is that your company loses humanity, it loses authenticity, it loses that relationship of trust, really. You fail to share any values or any purpose, mm-hmm. and th- there's no relationship building. I mean, you might as well not be on social media because what you're doing is you're treating social media like old media. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I give you an example. I, I've... I've been working with a financial institution for the last six months who've been very, very corporate. And um, there we worked with a, a one individual against a page with more than a million followers. Yeah. And we worked with one individual and focused their content and humanized their corporate corporate stuff in one person. The one person has beat the company page countless times hands down why because they've humanized and and i think there's something i want to pick up on what you said with the trust piece here when we come to the um trust piece you mentioned there i think when a company goes to that kind of corporatized strict there's a one the engagement disappears the interest disappears from the audiences so you basically you're controlling it at the cost of the crowd but we've just been working with a company financial services uh business thousands of employees more than a million followers on their uh linkedin uh we work with one individual and the one individual was hands down beating the page just because they were humanizing the we were humanizing the content that they were putting out so i think there is a trust piece about that that is pivotal on this humanized element yeah it's real yeah that's the first thing but i also think uh, and this might seem really simple but but i think this is important integrity is basically where your values and your actions line up and there's no trust without integrity and there's no inte- people won't see your integrity without consistency in other words if you go onto social media and just push a message once it doesn't mean anything it doesn't it's once people trust things because they've consistently seen the same message the same actions the same values playing out what do you how do you see that whole trust consistency and integrity thing fitting together on social well i i think you're absolutely right particularly when it comes to humanizing <laughs> the brand and i sorry about my dog bark uh, in the background. you got an agreement there <laughs> yeah 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 he agrees so um i think you 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 sort of hit the nail on the head there in the sense that i agree that a corporate page can only go so far in terms of of building that that relationship of trust uh, because ultimately, you know, whether you're a B2B or a B2C company, I, I like to say we're all people to people, right? We, we, there's always a person on the other side. So the best way for you to humanize a brand, the best way for you to create that relationship of trust is really to activate your people. Mm-hmm. Being, being your senior leadership, which should be active on social media and should be engaged on social media, but also like we were talking about your whole workforce, and you know, your customers as well, mm-hmm. because the the you know the, the the pyramid of trust goes probably something like you know people will trust your your what your customers say first, what your employees say. <laughs> <laughs> people will trust what your customers say first, what your employees say second, and only then will they trust what your senior management team says. Mm-hmm. And then at the very bottom of that pyramid is the company, right? The yeah. brand. So we, you do have to take all of that into consideration. Mm-hmm. In terms of creating that, that authenticity, and I, like I was saying, 
as a, as a company, you probably either s- sit on either side of this fence. Like I said, you're either very strict and create like a you know a guidebook and a playbook and and make all your community managers, your social media managers abide by those, and that's yeah. how you communicate and you sound bot like and unauthentic. Or you do like you know these sort of edgy brands do like Innocent or like Oatly, uh, which are great on social media because they sort of let their social media managers roam free. Mm-hmm. They hire very well. They hire people who are already a culture fit, who mm. already understand the brand tone of voice, who probably share the brand tone of voice personally. Mm. I've met a few of them and they do. They're all you know, people who are naturally funny and engaging. And then they just let them do whatever they want. They mm. go like, you know what? This is who we are as a brand. Now you can communicate for us. And there will be, there will be very little, you know, uh, Sometimes people supervision. Have- Sometimes people tie themselves in knots with tone and voice to the point where they don't know how to say anything. Agreed. Um, Agreed. I, I've seen one where it's like, we don't quote statistics of other brands or other, we don't quote statistics. We don't do this. We don't do that. We don't do that. I'm like, what do, do you, what, what, what do you do then? What do you say? Yeah. yeah. Now I think with tone of voice, you need to be, you need to, it's more, I always focus, I focus less on tone of voice, although tone of voice is important uh, in very broad terms. You know, we want to be supportive. We want to be uh, inclusive. We want, that, that's, those are all things that brands in general should um, aim to be on social. Mm-hmm. But I, I prefer another piece of document, which I've sort of uh, came up with myself, and that's helped me tremendously uh, before building any social media strategy, which I call the social media statement of purpose. And that's a very simple document that just states who you want to be as a brand on social media, why you're there, what are your core values, uh, mm-hmm. how you do not want to be perceived as. It's it's a sort of a do's and don'ts. And, yeah. and because it's a very simple document, what it does is it serves as a, a, a guiding compass for all your social media managers, for mm-hmm. all your community managers to uh, cross-check whatever they do, whatever content they put out, whatever interaction yeah. they have on social cross-check it with your values as a brand and what your purpose is on social. And if it doesn't fit 100%, then they need to bid it and go back to the drawing board. But yeah. it, it at least it helps them. It, it alleviates the pressure and it protects your brand's reputation while mm-hmm. giving them enough freedom to sound authentic and to be human and to create those relationships yeah. and to be people. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So talking about people, we were having a conversation in the office here and we're not 100% settled on this but we have this instinct that i'm i'm i was born in the 80s i know i look like i was probably born in the 60s but i was definitely born in the 80s right <laughs> um social media was kind of like something that came to me in early adulthood the generation below us it came to them in like early childhood and then you've got a generation where they've had it since birth. It's it's always been there. I think, and I could upset a lot of people, and you don't have to answer here in case I get you in trouble. I think my generation and the generation before were, were or still are to some degree a little bit naive about the sizzle of social media. But I think the new generation coming through can spot these people who are just like faking it till you make it on social media and just all sizzle much it's like they were born to spot it you know that's i i'm so glad you've opened this conversation because it's by far my favorite topic it is how does gen z uh you know act on social media what do they expect of it and how do they expect brands to act and uh, and to portray themselves and i actually think that the generations to come after the millennials, mm-hmm. us, uh, after the millennials, I think, like you said, these are generations that have a much higher, um, they demand much more out of brands in mm-hmm. terms of authenticity, in terms of purpose, in terms of mission. But I think most of all, in terms of values. Mm-hmm. And because purpose is sort of, you know, it's the buzzword of, not the year, but probably the decade, right? Mm-hmm. Companies, they they understand purpose up to the up to the C-suite. We can now be safely assured 
that all of the Fortune 100 companies and all the Fortune 500 companies probably understand the need for uh, purpose, right? And that's kind of done and dusted. And I would say that's the lowest common denominator right now. I think the next step will be Gen Z not accepting just purpose. Because purpose will be, it's a great compass for you to develop product. It's a great compass for you to uh, steer your workforce in the right direction and build company culture. But as a consumer, who really wears the shirt of purpose? Who, I mean, us as, you know, 90s kids, we wore brands because we identified, because the, the design of the brand because the uh, the voice of the brand somehow made us identify with it, sort of completed our personal identity, right? Mm -hmm. In our imaginarium, sort of yeah. in a nostalgic way. Kids today, well, kids, I say kids, but young people today, that's no longer the case because communication from brands is no longer a one-way street. There is now a conversation, right, with mm -hmm. social media. And, they've, they, and they were born used to this conversation. So for them, their relationship with brands, they, they will need to understand what brands give them back so that they can identify with them. So logos, you know, brand uh, looks and brand tone of voice, that no longer means anything to, the, to, to this generation. They want values. Yeah. What is this company doing, apart from selling a product and making a profit, that I can identify with in my set of values? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing with the Great Resignation is people taking a step back and saying, I no longer, the, the, my employer no longer reflects my values and what I prioritize as a person in a deeper, meaningful way. So companies need to completely rethink the way they do business. It's no longer just about purpose. Purpose is great to see them in the right direction. But what are your values? Mm -hmm. What are you here to do? And I was I was looking at you know how companies are stepping in uh, for, for 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 governments in their shortcomings regarding climate. Right, mm -hmm. business is stepping in for governments mm -hmm. when it comes to doing good on climate. I would put it out there, and this is just my intuition, that the next step we will see in a decade or so a very fine line between a company and an NGO. Mm -hmm. Big companies, particularly those who are established brands and that want to remain relevant, will have to have a very solid value strategy to society in things like education, in things like climate, etc. But I digress. No, no, but you've got a good point there because, because social media has created this two-way relationship. And if you think about it, we rewind to the 90s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if... Brand puts an advert out. Brand puts newspaper adverts out. Newspaper wouldn't put anything out against the brand because they'd lose their advertising books. Um, um, TV commercial, new TV news won't put anything out that compromises that. So if a brand decides we're going to greenwash or we're going to diversity wash or anything like that, they can get called out and suddenly the voice of the consumer can make, uh, and I don't think people get this, that the voice of the consumer can make a big multinational change their approach. Oh, yeah. And we've, I mean, we've seen it. We've seen it with so many already. Yeah. And because it's not just the consumer, mind you, because when you look specifically at social media, brands have to realize that it's not just the consumer that's looking at them. It's the investors. Mm -hmm. as well the investors are on social media yeah they're looking at what you say and investors now invest uh aligning with their own values mm -hmm. and their own purpose you know and their it, values and their beliefs it's, it's a little bit of a naughty one but do you remember the american retail chain i can't remember the name of them now and a reddit uh, people were shorting this um short uh, the big institutional investors were shorting this company on the stock market and its value was collapsing. And then a load of people on Reddit decided GameStop. to club GameStop. Yeah. And they basically, all these institutional investors lost money. Mm -hmm. 
so you're right it is a two-way relationship and if if you if you do if you put something on the tin you have to have it in so you have to deliver the goods not just in terms of your product but in terms of the way what you say you can't just pander to a trend anymore no because it's there no you can't jump on bandwagons anymore yeah and you you see that very clearly when you look at uh when you look at for instance how nike uh what nike did with uh with um with what's the the player's name again colin oh you've got me now i know what you're on about but i can't i can't, yeah. remember, the guy's can't name. remember his surname either but anyway um what Nike did there was they they created this this campaign which is true to their brand values, mm -hmm. and that worked out really well for them. And then you look at Pepsi and the faux pas with the with the with Kendall Jenner. I think it's Kendall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, with Kendall Jenner, and you see like that that's that was a bit like a it was a trend spotting exercise, mm -hmm. and it failed because it wasn't true to their own values and it wasn't authentic. Didn't come from the right place, and that. Gen Z can spot that from a distance, and mm -hmm. they will and they will be called out. Companies yeah. will be called out. So there's no more sort of looking at trends and jumping on them. No, there is staying true to who you are as a company, as a company. What your core purpose is, what your mm -hmm. core values are, what your culture mm -hmm. is about, and staying true to them and staying authentic to them, and you know, build it, and they will come most yeah. definitely. And it, it, it's not just going to be your customers, it's going to be your investors, it's going to be your employees as well. Mm -hmm. You're going to build a better workforce because you're speaking to their own values. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we live in fascinating times. And I guess that, that comes down to what the content you put out on social media as well. And the way you approach social media communications, there's no, this idea of pumping content out, of using it as, and I know you're, you, you support this idea as well, because I've heard you in the past talk about this sort of, one 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 way communication of putting out spilling out our values or our purpose as a company on social media and then not engaging mm -hmm. i'm a big advocate of every time you post something out on social media as a company anything anything you put out there has to be an engagement strategy yeah. you need to be ready as a company to engage with everyone who yeah. continues that conversation because what you're doing is you're creating a conversation with that post, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. So it's your responsibility as a moderator mm -hmm. to continue to keep that conversation going. Yeah. And and I say this, um, you know, um, I have a group of people on some of our programs and I say, if your social media is absolutely zilch, you've got to build a community. People who are choosing to invest into spending time following commenting liking sharing if they think that nobody wants to be somebody's you know uh amplifier <laughs> so they're doing it because one they agree with you one they believe in you but actually they have a level of relationship with you now you can't you know you can't have everybody come and tour your factories and you know know you all by name yeah but but you can build that relationship where they feel like I'm part of this. Yeah. And that's a good point. It's the everyone, right? Why everyone? That's the other sort of fallacy of, of social yeah. media marketers at the moment. It's the the uh, illusion of reach. Yeah. And you go like, uh, oh, we need to, you know, it's the old mantra. If you try to appeal to everyone, you appeal to no one. And that's yeah. absolutely true, always. Yeah. And you go back to, uh, you know, Seth Godin's smallest viable audience or, you know, mm -hmm. the, the audience of one and all these really powerful yeah. uh, uh, concepts of finding your niche mm -hmm. and sticking to it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we want to do at Coca-Cola HPC as well is we're not here for, for, you know, widespread brand awareness. That's not our game. What we want is to use social media to achieve key business objectives mm -hmm. for the wider company. Social media is here to support that. And to support that, we need to identify where our niche stakeholders are mm -hmm. And use social media to create conversations with them, yeah. and that's and that's really that's what we're here to do. Yeah, and and do you know what? We're on the same wavelength. Uh, I did a video yesterday um, about the five levels of social authority, and I'm sure there's other versions of this, but 
there's the people at one end who they have no authority. They're just churning out sales pitches. Mm. And it's like, buy my stuff. This is my message. Broadcasters, basically. Yeah. And then at the other end, you have the influencers. And they're like, I put a post out and loads of people do something on my command. Yeah. Uh, and I mean that in the truest sense of people who actually can put a post out and people actually do it. There's a whole space between there that you can occupy, but a lot of people think I have to be up there. Yeah, I have to be up there. And I, I argue there's a sweet spot where you've got the right group of people for your goal. And that might be 200 people. That might be all you need. It might be 10,000 people. And, you know, I don't know how many yours would be, but it doesn't matter about the millions. It's just how big does your audience need to be to support your goals and invest in that audience? Precisely. And be helpful to them. And that actually you've touched in a really important topic for me, which is influences. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the concept of what an influencer is, is has already started to change, but will change dramatically in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Because I don't believe in, and this is again, this is anecdotal, but I don't believe in the efficacy of big star influencer campaigns. Mm -hmm. And that's because I, I was listening to a really uh, curious take uh, from Gary V mm -hmm. on the Super Bowl ads the other day. And we were they were talking about uh, the Larry David uh, spot on the Super Bowl. And they were, and, and Gary V was scratching his head saying, I remember Larry David, I just don't remember what the brand was. And I think that's such a, I mean, for me personally, that's always the case. I get distracted by celebrity influences yeah. and I forget what their brand, what the brand is that they're supposed to yeah. be representing. So influencer campaigns, usually they are most useful to the influencers themselves. Yeah. <laughs> you know, can I give you an example of this? And it's, it's a bit more of a small, smaller business context, but I, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example that this works in other scenarios. So I encourage companies, one of the ways they can build trust and authority and showcase their expertise is to give free value in whatever way they can. So, so one of the great ways, it may not apply in your scenario, of course, but if you're a consultant or a coach or a marketing consultant, social media marketer, people have to believe that you can do what you say you can do. They've got to look you in the eyes and go, I think you're the right choice. So I said to them, you've got to have somehow a, a connection where they can see and experience you to understand you're credible and know what you're doing. So I say, do a webinar. Don't, don't sell on it. Just give value. You know, show yeah. them how to build a post or show them how to uh, understand the situation better. Great way to get that kind of interaction and, and exposure. And they're really easy to do. And this one company was uh, resisting doing it in that way because they wanted big numbers. <laughs> so they got a guest on. Yeah. So they brought in a well-known name, um, you know, not megastar, but a well-known name in their industry to come in and, and do a talk. And they're thinking, ah, we get that person in and we get that crowd. And now that crowd, like us, they did it against my advice. They got 900 people. So they were like, you know, they were, they were ready to die and go to heaven. It was that great for them. All the feedback. It was a really insightful talk from such and such. Yeah. And it's yeah. the same principle you're talking about. Yeah. Is the name is a distraction. No one remembers a sponsor, right? Yeah. Who remembers the sponsor? And why should they? I mean, unless you are giving value as, as a company, as a brand, then you should not be remembered for whatever it is that you're setting up. And that's precisely it. I mean, I think you're spot on when you talk about providing free value. And I'm talking about these solopreneurs and this, yeah. you know, these smaller businesses that are trying to make it. I think absolutely give content away for free. Give valuable content away for free because that is, and, and to your smallest viable audience, you know, mm -hmm. build that smallest viable audience because that's how you become a subject matter expert. Mm -hmm. That's, and those are going to be 
your influences. Yeah. Those are going to be the people who talk to other people about how much they trust you. Yeah. Right. And then if they want to buy a product and you happen to be selling it, or if they need a service that you happen to be providing, they'll spend their money on you because the, the, the relationship and the trust is already there. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Duarte, what's your exciting plan for social media for the next six months? What are you really, do you have any goals that you're looking to achieve? I have, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a tough question because, you know, secrets of the trade and all, but, uh, but, you know, I'm, I can tell you that I've been on this job for three, three and a half months, something like that. So I'm, you know, still getting my feet under the table. Um, I'm building the strategy right now for Coca-Cola HPC. So I have a few exciting ideas uh, for the brand. And, you know, I can tell you with a certain degree of um, caution, because I, th I think this is going to, uh, take flight, but it, you can never be sure, that I want us to be, if one of our goals is to become a subject matter expert and the sort of the, the, the industry leader when it comes to sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. The voice. Then my thought process was, okay, we can either go out to the rooftop, which is arguably paid advertising yeah. uh, or paid social posts and, and shout as loud as we can that we have just ranked really high on the DJSI or the S&P, or we can create a platform to our smallest viable audience, to the sustainability leaders within our industry, mm -hmm. uh, like a podcast, for mm -hmm. instance, uh, where we invite these leaders to come in to talk about their sustainability efforts. We hear what other companies are doing within our industry regarding sustainability, and we become a platform where other people come to us. By building that platform, what you're doing essentially is you are cementing your reputation and you are creating trust in your brand mm -hmm. in the sustainability area. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is one example of something we could do. I'm not saying we will do it, but it's one idea that that I've uh, entertained, and uh, and there's more like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the yeah. great thing about organic um, is, you know, paid does give you a very big megaphone. It's very expensive, but it gives you a very big megaphone. But one of the things about organic, just to kind of come full circle on your trust piece, is people discover the content, and so people approach it in a different way than an ad. Oh, you're putting this in front of me because you want something versus I found this. So it's interesting. There's almost like this automatic perception that an ad, there's a hidden agenda, which there is. You know, it's, I mean, I, yeah, again, it's, we are exactly in the same wavelength here. I'm Mr. Organic. I mm -hmm. from from food to drinks to, to everything, but especially on social media, I always prefer organic because mm -hmm. did you know and this you is you anecdotal. don't trust the guy with the Lamborghini who wants to just help you? Does he even drive that Lamborghini? Well, he does for an hour whilst he's yeah. renting. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but you know, it, anecdotally, look at this. I read this the other day and it, it was it cracked me up did you know that you're more likely to be trained as a navy seal than you are to click on a banner ad <laughs> <laughs> this came from a linkedin marketing solution so i trust that it's true but it it is the funniest uh, um you know reflection of what paid social media ads are i mean unless you do ABM account-based marketing really seriously and you're a B2B and that in that way paid is useful because you're not targeting for reach you're targeting a specific person yeah. or a specific set of people with a specific message that's fine that's smart paid but boosting posts on Facebook that gets you nothing mm -hmm. and you I know why people do it because you got a little button there that says boost <laughs> How enticing is that, right? Yeah. Ooh, you go and you go, oh, it's just clicking here and it'll boost the post for me. I love boost. 
Let's do it. It does nothing for you. So don't do it. Build an organic social media strategy because an organic social media strategy is your foundation of trust right there. Yeah. That's your smallest viable audience. Those are the people who will be champions for your brand. That's how you will manage to scale up in time. And then eventually when you've got that community, when you've when you've set your values as a brand and you've communicated them to the people that matter to you, then sure, do a bit of paid for reach if you want. That's fine. But I don't care about paid and I don't care about reach personally. Ads, ads won't play, replace a community. Absolutely not. Yeah. Never. Because ultimately... What's the conversion rate there? And even if there is a conversion rate, what's the return on investment? Heads are expensive. They'll become mm -hmm. more expensive with time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, quoting, I think it's Mark Twain who said something like uh, um, reports on the death of, uh, of, well, in this case, organic mm -hmm. have been wildly exaggerated. I agree. Yeah. I think that organic is here to stay. Mm -hmm. And I don't think this pay to play tendency is going to take over social media like everyone thinks it will uh, and if you look um there's a um somebody i i find really insightful mark ritson he's a bit provocative mm. but he's common sense approach of top of the tree of all marketing is that top of mind word of mouth you still can't beat it um it's it's the you know even down to TV commercials and some of the big things that help you get the message out. He firmly believes in, in terms of the long term benefit, um, getting people to talk and respond to you because they've seen you is better than pushing something directly in front of people on social media. So I, I'm I'm firmly with you there, Duart. We are out of time, but. This has been an absolute pleasure to have you on. I want to do this again, and we'll we'll pick a we'll we'll um we'll put the world to rights again. Um, if people want to connect with you, uh, I'll put your LinkedIn URL here because you're you're Mister LinkedIn too. <laughs> I'll put your links in there. But I really appreciate you coming on the podcast, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you get up to on social media. So thanks, listeners. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, Dean. It was a great chat. Really great chat. Thank you.